help us. Help your servants do thy will, for we wish to do your will and only thy will. May nothing come between us and the work you have placed in our hands. For it says, whatever is in your hands, do it mightily for the Lord. So Lord God, before the sun sets tonight, we want to say thank you. We want to say thank you, Lord, for this life and all the breath that you have given us. For this you have given us. And for a, such a time as this, you have created us. So we thank you, O Lord, until we meet in your home. Amen. 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 Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do, Jesus, you're the center of my joy, Jesus, you're the center of my joy all that's good and perfect comes from you you're the heart of my contentment hope for all You're the center of my joy. Oh, when I've lost my direction, you're the compass for my way. You're the fire and the light when nights are long in sadness you are laughter all oh, the shatters all oh, my fears when i'm alone your the hand is there to hold Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment hope for all i do oh jesus you're the center of my joy Jesus, you're the center of my joy. 
Amen. That is our song for today, and that is our song forever. We thank you, dear Lord, for keeping us and, and blessing us. And this Sunday is just this Sunday, and it has been Pride Month, and we also um, are celebrating those churches that are open and affirming. Those churches that say, when they say welcome, they mean welcome. And so this morning, we take you to a place called justice, the God of justice. Let me read you Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing the praises of God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirits depart, they return to the ground, and the very day their plans will no more exist. Blessed are those who are helped by the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord of their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. The Lord, he remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed, and he gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoner free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who bow down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion. For all generation, praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord, Grace Church. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, Mother God, Holy Spirit, we seize this opportunity to bombard the heavens with our prayers and with our faith. Let your spirit of expectation permeate this place. Let the spirit and the power and the presence and your peace bathe us, soothe us in your loving light. Enfold us with your fragrance of love saturate us with a new and a divine anointing so that we may rebuke the forces of evil let your word rise up in us definitively emphatically and prophetically in jesus name we pray amen amen we started last week talking about francis of assisi and i wish to continue with francis of assisi because he is one of the greatest speakers that we have Hold on one second, time out. If you could change the batteries. Catherine. Francis of Assisi, who was one saint who was revered by many, a religious figure in the Christian community. He died when he was only 50 years old. His body were worn out from fasting and suffering. He had prayed and prayed and suffered and suffered. It is said he dedicated his life to a simple life. He dedicated his work to those who were hungry, those who were poor, and those who were sick. He had such an impact that 800 years later, his influence is still on this earth. So many people, so many organizations are still inspired by St. Francis of Assisi. Certainly one of my favorite prayers is the prayer that he sings often. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is suffering, let me so heal. What a wonderful words and what a wonderful prayer. For he taught us to be patient, to be watchful in prayer, to be strenuous in work, to be moderate in speech, to be reserved in the manner of a grateful forever and for favors as we prepare on this earth for the kingdom of glory and the kingdom of God. But Francis of Assisi had a special gift. He could look in the eye of an emperor and the eye of a beggar and revere both just the same. He could meet with the Pope or a per per poor person and still have the same respect and honor for both life. He could meet with sultan and princes and poor people, homeless folks. 
It is said when he looked in the eye of everyone that they felt like they were the only ones on this planet. What a special gift. What a special honor to be in someone's presence who sees you and nothing else. This is the gift St. Francis of Assisi had. It is said two years before his life ended that he went up to the mountain of Laverna, and on that mountain he spent 40 days and 40 nights. It is said he got the wounds of Christ, the stigmata, the hands were looked like wounds of nails, and also the feet, wounds of nails. On his side, he had wounds of nails. This he had, the image of God. For he knew that love was the image of God. He knew creativity and imagination was the image of God. But he also knew suffering and justice was the image of God. And so we have the image of God for his keen sense of those, the least of these, he was appreciative and looked towards. Howard Thurman would say, what does your gospel say to those who are disinherited, dispossessed, and have their backs up against the wall? If your gospel doesn't speak to those things and those people, then it's not really speaking at all. And so that brings us into the center of our text. It is justice that we talk about this morning. Many people accuse the Bible of being oppressive or being a document that promotes injustice. Can I tell you that's not true? Can I tell you don't believe that? Because the Word of God is a liberating Word of God. We celebrate the Word and the God of justice this morning. That this morning, in the text, Although it doesn't say justice, it refers to justice in the Hebrew text, which is the word misfat. It appears over 200 times in the Bible because it says, He who upholds the cause and oppresses and gives food to the hungry, that is the one who God is working for and with. So sometimes you will hear misfat as uphold the cause, Sometimes you'll hear it as righteous, and sometimes you'll hear it as justice. But certainly the justice of God. Micah 6.8 summarizes the justice of God. And I love the question. It says, what is required of us? To do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. If there was anybody that walked humbly with our God, St. Francis of Assisi knew because he took a vow of poverty, that he was willing, if he met a beggar that had clothes that were worse than his, he would exchange clothes with them. He would give him the shirt off his back. He vowed a life of poverty and to walk humbly with our God. For there are two sides to justice, do justice and also the love of mercy. And so this morning, I wish to give you three things the life of justice, the God's work of justice, and how do we live more justly in this world? How do we live more justly in this world? Essentially, there are two parts to justice. There's the negative side, which is to condemn, to judge, to punish the evildoers for what they have done. We have an obligation that if you see injustice done, that you do something or say something about it. That you cannot just walk away, you cannot turn a blind eye, you cannot turn your back. We see that so often today where injustice is being carried out and people are watching. The Bible says you're just as guilty as those who are creating the harm. And so the thing that Proverbs 31, 9 tells us there are two sides to justice. Number one, you have to speak up and judge fairly. Judge fairly. But the second part is defend the rights of the poor and the needy. That is misfought. 
And often when the Bible refers to misfot, there are four groups of people, the widow, the orphan, the, the immigrant, and the poor. These are the four groups that we should always be making sure, for they are the weakest, they are the most vulnerable, they are the most powerless, they are the ones that get trampled on and abused in our society today. Who is looking out for their interest? Who is looking out for their cause? And so there's two sides to justice this morning. One side is to make sure that the wrongdoers get punished. But the second side is to make sure we uplift and lift up those who are being oppressed, those who are being downtrodden, those who are the most vulnerable in our society today. Job teaches us this because he believes that he is being treated unjustly, that he is suffering unjustly. For he says, I am a man in chapter 29. Whoever heard me spoke well, and those who saw me commended me, because I rescued the poor who cried for help, and the fatherless who had none to assist them. The one who was dying blessed me. I made the widow's heart sing. I put righteousness on as my clothing, and justice as my robe and my turban. I was an eye to a blind, and a feet to the lame, I was a father to the needy, and I took the cause of the stranger. I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims out of their teeth. Job is telling us this morning that his justice was to make sure that those were in need, he fulfilled those needs. And that's why this morning, as we see the Black Lives Matter resonating all over this world, because of eight minutes and 46 seconds, seconds, we understood how unjust this moment is. Many blacks across America right now experience injustice just because the color of their skin. They've been killed, imprisoned, enslaved, and tortured just because the color of their skin. Or they have been used as a political tool to get elected with the war on drugs. Do you see how unjust this moment is? We cannot ignore the widow, the orphan, the downtrodden, the immigrant, the poor. These are the people we are to lift up. And I know when I say this, you think it's just work of charity. The charity should be doing this work. No, the Bible says it is not charity. This is the life of justice that you and I must lead. This is the work that we must do. Job goes on on chapter 31. If I have denied justice to any of my servants, if I have denied the desires of the poor, if I have kept bread for myself, not sharing it with the fatherless, if I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence over the courts, then let my arms fall from my shoulders, let them be broken off at my joints, for I dread destruction from God, for I fear that his splendor, I could not do such a thing. These are the sins that if we do not help those who are in need, not only is it a sin against those people, it's a sin against God in the Most High. It is the most unjust to see people without food and not share food. It is most unjust to have clothing and see people who are naked and without clothing. This is not just charity. This is not just helping out others. This is the work of justice. It would be a sin against God. It would be a sin against the Most High. I know this is strong language this morning. I realize this is severely shifting your paradigm because we thought that was charity. No, it's a part of who we are and a part of what we do. This is the part of God that represents us. We represent God here on earth. And therefore, if we are in the image of God, we ought to be doing. That's what motivated St. Francis of Assisi to help all those he encountered because he wanted to be and make sure they see and experience God in the moment. And so doing justice is not just punishing the wicked. It is also lifting up those who are oppressed, caring for those who have been let down. You can't ignore the poor. You have to take them seriously. 
It has to become important in your life. If they have no impact on the way you are living, if they have no impact on the way you're spending your money, if they have no impact on the way you're spending your time, not only is that selfish, but you are insulting God himself. You are dishonoring the God of the heavens. And so Psalm 146 says this to us, that we are to feed the hungry, that we're releasing the unjustly incarcerated. It means working with the sick and the blind and those who need our help. It means loving and helping those who are burdened, those who need emotional support. It means guarding over the immigrant, giving them a place of refuge, making sure they're not exploited and not hurt. Watching over the single parent family, watching over the widow, watching over the orphan. Brian Stevens said the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. The first thing we must do is live a life of justice because we serve the God of justice. I remember when Re Reverend Jesse Jackson was running for president and Reverend Gardner Taylor and him were having a conversation. And Jesse said, I'm really concerned about getting on stage and debating with people who are professional politicians, who have all the facts and all the figures. I don't have all of those things. And Reverend Gardner Taylor says, let me tell you what you do have. You can take the conversation where nobody else can take it. And as Christians, you can take the work where nobody else will go. And that is the gift of Christianity, for we know it's not just good ethics. It's not just good morality. It's good theology. And so caring for the poor, caring for those who are in need and pouring out our hearts reflects the character of God, reflects the image of God. And so this morning, the significance of Psalm 146 is that God introduces himself as the all-powerful, omnipotent, om omnipotent, omnipotent, loving and he's showing you that his power. But then he says, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything within. The next thing he says is, he upholds the causes of the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoner free, and the Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord God depicts this enormous power. Sure, he holds the moon and the sun and the stars and everything in place. But guess what? He takes care of the poor. He takes care of the hungry. He sets the prisoners free that have been incarcerated wrongfully. And that's how your God wants to be known. Let me read another scripture for you because this is throughout the whole Bible. It's amazing when I read this, all the, all the whole Bible lit up like a Christmas tree. It changed the way I read the Bible. In Deuteronomy 10, it says this, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome God, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow. He loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. Are you, and if you love those who are foreigners, he says, and you, are to love those who are the foreigners, for you yourself were a foreigner in Egypt. You yourself were an immigrant. You were, yourself were homeless. You yourself did not have what God now has given to us. And so we say this morning that God introduces himself as the father to the fatherless, as a defender of the widows. Do you know how important that is? Do you understand the shift and the understanding of what that means? Those of us who went into business, we wanted to make sure our website and our business card had a logo that said who we are and what we did and what we were about, and so people would get it as soon as they saw it. A lot of times when I go to a speaking engagement, people are like, well, how should we introduce you? We got a long list of things here. And I says, keep it short, number one. But number two, induce me as the pastor of Grace Congregational Church. Because if you introduce me as a pastor, it encompasses everything that I do. 
I believe that's the greatest honor one could have on this earth. To be in the care of souls of others, there is no greater role and position on this earth. And so just introduce me as pastor of Grace Congregational Church of Harlem. And your God wants to be induced by the one who cares for the poor, defends the defenseless, protects the immigrant, and looks out for the widow and the orphan. The God is the God of justice. This is a shift because ancient gods were looked at very differently. They served the kings. They served the ones with power. In fact, if you won the war, it meant your God was stronger and your God won. That's how it was looked at. And so back in 2 Kings 5, Naaman the Syrian, he there, Naaman comes to the king of Israel because he has leprosy and he needs healing. And he understands that the, the God of, of Israel does heal folks. And so he goes there with a boatload of money and he says, here, here's my money, heal me. And it says the king wrenches his cloak and says, that's not how this God works. That's not how this God works. It's not for sale. It's not for sale. In fact, in Acts 8, 9, Simon the sorcerer, he sees the apostles laying hands and healing people. And he, it reads like this. When Simon saw the spirit was given at laying on hands of the apostles, he offered them money and said, Give me the ability so that I may lay hands and allow the Holy Spirit to be received by people. And Peter says, may your money perish with you because God is not for sale. This ain't for sale. This is God's healing. You want to talk about a medical plan? Jesus healed and didn't charge a soul. He didn't charge a soul. And so the God who has all the power, who holds the heavens, he holds the sea, he holds the sun and the star and the moons all in place, he wants to be known as the defender of the defendant list. And so when Howard Thurman says, how does your gospel speak to those whose back is up against the wall, who are disinherited, who are dispossessed, this is how he speaks to those. And so what does that mean to us? He gives grace to the powerless, love to those who are weakest, and cares for those who are poorest. We who are Christians, we who are supposed to be the representative of God, made in his image, are supposed to be not only spreading the word, not only inviting people to come hear the word and be in the presence of God, but they are to see us doing the work of God. I know Grace Church, we go to the park and we feed the homeless and we deliver the word of God and we do communion, but it's not enough. There is more work to be done. And I hope Grace Congregational Church is my prayer and all churches and all temples and all synagogues that they become famous for helping people. Because when pastors meet, they say, well, how many people are in your church? I hope the new barometer is how many people are you helping? How many communities are you transforming? How many lives are you saving? That is the important thing this morning. So that when people see you, they get a glimpse of the glory of God. They can see how God operates in this world. They can see the character. Can I tell you, that takes down the blocks. That takes down all their filters when they see you doing the work of God. Because Jesus Christ, wherever you take the gospel, it translates to love. It doesn't matter what language, however you read the gospel of Jesus Christ and his actions in this world, it translates into love. And that is what he's famous for, and that is what those who call by his name ought to be famous for as well. That is my prayer. That is my hope. And so let us understand, how do we live a life of justice? For this text illuminates it for us. How do you become people of justice? Do you just talk about justice? Do you just read about justice? Maybe you just come to church and hear about justice. No, you have to praise the God of justice. You have to worship the God of justice. You have to adore the God of justice. For the psalmist says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. 
I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praises to my God as long as I live. This psalmist is praising the God of justice. Yes, we all know that this is the work we should be doing. Yes, we know this is what I should do. But are we doing it? Do we do it consistently enough? Are we doing it to the magnitude that we really could do this? Are we habitually in the work of justice? Something has to happen on the inside. Something has to move our heart and move our soul. A song I've been listening to this week, there's a praise on the inside that I can't keep to myself. I hollow and stirring up from the depths of my soul. So excuse me if I get a little giddy. Excuse me if I act a little strange. But praise is a way to say thank you. And so when we can get this praise on the inside, when we can get this worship on the inside, it's one thing to hear the singers praising God. It's one thing to hear the musicians praising God. But you got to feel something deep on the inside. Something has got to move. Something has got to change your heart, your mind, and your soul and encompass you. Something has to capture your imagination. You know, when you find a book and you read a book and you're so excited about it, you have to tell somebody. You've seen a movie and it's just moved you to tears and you have to tell somebody about it. Or you've heard a song and you say, you got to listen to this. It has captured your imagination. It has captured your heart. That's how you ought to feel about the God of justice. It ought to capture your heart. It ought to capture you in the inside and move you to say, praise the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Praise his holy name. It's got to get into your heart. It's got to kindle your emotions. Look, the God of justice. We have to turn to the God of justice this morning. But there's a problem. Somebody say, Pastor, what's the problem? See, when I talk about the God of love, you say, hallelujah. When I talk about the God of mercy, you say, yes, Pastor. When I talk about the God of mercy, you say, yes, Pastor. And then when I say the God of justice, you say, no, Pastor. Really, Pastor? Can we go back to the God of love? I like that. I like the God of mercy and grace. But the God of justice? How do you want me to get excited about the God of justice? Because the God of justice, if we really listen to what Jesus said, remember the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you've heard it said, thou shalt not kill. And whoever murders is liable And will be judged. But then he takes it even further. He says, don't even get angry at your neighbor. He says, don't say raka, which means you're nothing, you're a nobody. He says, don't say that to your neighbor. Because if you say that, you have killed their spirit. You have killed them. And so you're not even to get them angry. And so we don't take this lightly. We don't take this our neighbor as insignificant because Jesus says not only we are to not or we love them but we're to pray for them and so this morning we know that we have fallen short and we are to be judged that we are contributing and creating injustice in this world for we have not been loving our neighbor as ourselves we have not been loving our neighbor as ourselves We have not been loving the weak and the vulnerable. We have been ignoring them. We have walked by them. And we this morning ourselves are subject to condemnation. And so when we want to talk about the God of justice, I understand we don't want to talk about it because we too need to be judged. We ought to be judged this morning. And so there's one thing that helps us celebrate the God of justice this morning. The first sermon that Jesus ever preached, Luke 4, 18 to 19. It's important whatever pastor, whatever the first sermon is they preach. Can I tell you what my first sermon is that I preached at Grace Congregational Church? 
it's time to rebuild. 15 years ago, I preached a sermon called, It's Time to Rebuild. How profound is that in this moment as we are rebuilding? And so the first sermon always helps to understand the mission and the purpose. And so Jesus takes out Isaiah 61. And he reads from that scroll, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to release the darkness from the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. He reads that, that he's to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom to the captives, and release the prisoners from darkness. Because at the end of 61, it says, I'm here to proclaim the year of the Lord, the favor. That's the good side of justice. And then he says, and the day of vengeance of God. That's the punishing side of justice. What's interesting is he reads the whole scripture and stops at the sentence before the day of vengeance of our God. And the reason is that Jesus does this is because he didn't come to bring vengeance. He came to bear vengeance for us. He came to help us and to lift us up. He did not come to bring judgment, but he came to bear judgment. The reason he says, I've come to lift up, and he didn't say, I've come to punish the wicked, because Jesus stands with us, stands by us, but he stood in for us. Jesus came and went on the cross and received the punishment that we have because he said, I didn't come to bring the vengeance of God. I came to bear the vengeance of God. And so as we accept this morning that we are saved by grace, we are saved by the grace of a loving God. That judgment had to come and somebody had to get it. And your God was willing to take off his crown and his scepter and put on a crown of thorns so that he could accept the judgment that we were to receive. In James chapter 2, it says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothing or daily food. If one of you say to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but do nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Faith without work is dead. And so we're not saved by our works, but like Francis of Assisi, when you know that you're a wretch, when you know that you're in need of a savior and you have been touched by grace, what happens then is you have to go out and touch other people by grace because you know how important this is. We have to do the justice work in the world. We must help those in the world. I know there are some that say, I don't really care for justice. There's too many people that are in need, and therefore I'm just not going to do anything. And then there's the people on the other extreme who say, I'm just, and I'm going to do injustice for poverty and hunger and police reform and all of that. But can I say to you this morning, we have to do it because the God of justice reigns. And we who are made in his image represent him on this earth. The cross ought to tell you that justice is important to God. For his cross is in the center of this church. The cross is in the center of our life. And the cross is in the center of our faith. Because Jesus wants you to know that it is in the center God placed the cross. That justice is so important that his son had to die for you and for me. It is the centerpiece of the Christian faith. 
to take a symbol that used to mean tyranny and death and turn it into a symbol of salvation, of peace, hope, and love. It is a transformation. But the cross also lets you know. Because many of us think, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I'm a victim. The cross lets us know that we're the perpetrator, we're the perpetrator, we're the perpetrator. We have not loved our brothers and sisters as we should love ourselves. And that is the mission of our work today, that the gracious hand of God is upon us because we have acted like we belong to ourselves. We've acted like we've created all the air, the sun, and the moon. We've acted like we have done all of this. Can I say we are the perpetrators of injustice? That when George Floyd died, I stopped for a moment to say, what part did I play? How many times did I see racism occur and I didn't say a word? How many times were people racist and I didn't act? I contributed to the downfall of this world. And so this morning, we're gracious and thankful for a God who said, I will place myself on the cross. I will take the justice because I am the God of justice. I'm so thankful we serve the God of justice this morning. I'm so thankful that he didn't set it aside, but put it in the center of our lives. I'm so thankful this morning that he created a people who would do justice in this world. For in the end, know that everything is going to be all right. In the end, everything's going to be all right. There will be no more tears, no more pain, and no more crying. Jesus Christ did not come to bring God's vengeance. He came to bear it, to create us into gracious agents, humble agents, those who would taste the sweetness of salvation. Those who would see and experience salvation. And so I want you to know in God's realm, there is no hunger. There are no blindness. There are no people with leprosy. There are no people that are falsely accused. There are no people killing one another. There are no people hurting one another. There are no people suffering and there's no oppression. There are no widows, and there are no orphans. There are no beggars, and there are no poor people in God's realm. And so this morning, we have to become the agents of justice. We have to be the people on earth. As Martin Luther King said, true peace is not the absence of tension, but it is the presence of justice. And we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like a mighty water and righteousness like a mighty stream. We hope that justice and peace will meet and embrace and dance and the bells and the feast of this divine joy. For we celebrate today the God of justice. Amen. <laughs>